Hello, everyone, and welcome back. In this lecture, and many of the lectures that are going to follow it, we're going to talk about what are called parametric curves. These are curves through the plane where your x and y components along the curve are given by some hidden variable, a parameter. Now, what we're going to do in the videos that follow this is introduce sort of calculus on these curves. So asking about things like derivatives, right? What is the instantaneous rate of change? But the goal for this lecture is just to introduce these parametric curves and show you how we can use a little bit of algebra and a little bit of our intuition that we've built up over the years of doing calculus in order to sketch these things and get a good grasp on what it is that they're describing. So let's go ahead and take a look at what I want to talk about today. Now, the general idea here will be that we have two functions in terms of the same variable. So we say we have f of t and g of t. In this case, t is what's called our parameter. It's our sort of hidden variable. And we say that points on the, in the plane, x and y, are given in terms of the f and g here. So what that means is if you imagine as t moves forward or as uh, t sort of progresses, the independent variable here, you are defining ordered pairs in the plane. So you actually have coordinates that you are describing for each value of t. And what happens is that if you uh, sketch out all of these points for every single value of t in your domain, you will get, as long as f and g are continuous, you'll get some kind of curve that winds through your x and y plane. And every single point on this curve is given in terms of those f and g functions at a particular value of t. So for example, for t1, just some arbitrary value, you might be at that point on the curve. Whereas for another point, say t2, you might be at this point on the curve. Now, the important thing for you to understand here is that t doesn't show up in this graph. Only x and y the f and g, that are described by the functions f and g. So one way you can think about this is maybe you take a map and you plot out your road trip on that map. So you have a nice line that goes from say city to city or whatever your two destination, where you started and your destination are. And you tick off along that map where you were at each time of the day. So you say, okay, after one hour of driving, we were right here. And then after an hour and a half, we were here. And after three hours, we were here and whatever it happens to be. That's a parametric curve. The parameter here is time. That's not showing up on the map. That's just what you are sort of filling in the data of. But what shows up is the distance that you traveled, where you moved from, the x and y coordinates on your two-dimensional mapping. Now, you're going to hear me a lot refer to the independent variable t as time. And this is sort of natural, right? Because we think of uh, these, par these parametric curves right here as sort of describing something moving through space with respect to time. Now, of course, this doesn't always have to be time. We use t because it typically means time, but this could be any sort of independent variable that you want it to be. Okay. So, you know, this is just a very, very vague way of describing these things. What I want to do throughout this uh, lecture is give you examples and show you how we can interpret these things. So let's start with an example. So example one, let's say sketch the curve. So sketch the curve defined by the parametric equation. So defined by the parametric equations. So again, remember I said this is a parametric curve, parametric equations, in this case, uh, are your functions f and g. So my f function is sine of pi t over 2. My y function is just given by t. And 
In this case, we're going to restrict t to be, be between 0 and 6. Now, one way that you can sketch these things is just by creating a table of values, right? This is probably how you were introduced to functions originally anyways, by just sort of finding points in the curve and sort of sketching in between. So let's do that. Let's start with t values. Those give way to x and y values. So we have one, uh, sorry, let's start at zero. We'll go through the integers. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, when t is equal to zero, the x coordinate is sine of zero, which is also zero. Similarly, y is equal to t. So that tells us that at t equal to zero, we start at the origin zero, zero. Now, when t is equal to one, we get sine of pi over two for x, which is equal to one as well. And again, y is equal to t, so it's equal to one. Now, when t is equal to two, we get sine of pi, which is zero for x, and we get t for y. Similarly, uh, the x coordinate at t equal to three becomes sine of three, uh, three pi over two minus one, and three for the y. Then uh, for t equal to four, similarly, you get sine of two pi, zero, and y is four. And then we sort of restart this thing because of two pi periodicity of sine. So we get one and five and zero and six. Okay, so now we've got some points on our curve. The question is, you know, how do we fill in these points? Or how do we, how do we sketch out the curve? Well, let's go ahead and do this. So here's going to be my x, y plane. Here is x, here is y. And let's use red to fill in some of our points. So the first point is 0, 0. And this is when t is equal to 0. The hidden variable here is the parameter t. Uh, then the next point is at 1, 1 when t is equal to 1. Then we are at uh, 0, 2 when t is equal to 2. Then we go up to um, minus 1, 3 when t is equal to 3. And then up to 0, 4 when t is equal to 4. And then we sort of reset the curve due to periodicity, and we are at 1, 5 when t is equal to 5. And then finally, we have 0, 6 when t is equal to 6. So now what we can do is we can sort of fill in the gaps here, right? So if you need to, you can use more points. Um, but, you know, this is sort of just a sine curve in uh, that's been rotated upwards. So it's sort of pointing vertically. And so we get these sort of typical sine curves, oscillations in space. And so this is what our parametric curve would look like. Again, I wanna emphasize to you that this is in the x, y plane. T is completely hidden, right? T of one half is like somewhere around here on the curve, and it gives you another uh, uh, value in X and Y, right? So it's, T is not showing up explicitly. I cannot emphasize that enough. Now, maybe you're wondering to yourself, you know, Jason, how did you know that this thing is going to be a sine curve? Really, you only did this with like six, um, six points on the curve or seven points. You know, there could be weird things happening in between. Well, of course, you know, I'm pretty good at math, just like you are who's watching this. And we have, a, we have a pretty good intuition for these things. We can look at those curves and maybe get a nice feel for it. But, you know, intuition isn't everything. How can you do this instead? Well, you can say since y is equal to t, then you can similarly write this as x as a function of y, which is sine of pi y over 2, which 
is just a regular function now, right? It's kind of weirdly written because the independent variable is y, but this is just a sine curve sort of uh, written in terms of y and as opposed to in terms of x. So that's another way uh, that we can really understand these curves. And that's how we're gonna look at these things going forward, I think. I think that's the best way because you know we, we're very good at probably one dimensional functions now. Okay, let's take another look at this and let's see how I do my little method there uh, and figure out what these curves actually look like just using that, that algebraic manipulation. So without a table of values. So let's say same question, sketch the parametric curves or sketch the curve defined by the parametric equations Okay, so x is equal to t squared, y is equal to t plus one. And in this case, we're gonna let t go over every single possible real number, right? So at the beginning of time, t minus infinity, all the way up to t equal to infinity, to the end of time. All right, so what does this thing actually look like? Well, I'm gonna do my same little trick that I used at the end to, to see that X can be written as a function of Y. So similarly, I can say Y is equal to T plus one. This is the same as saying T is equal to Y minus one. And X is equal to T squared is equal to Y minus one squared. This is a parabola, right? This is a parabola in terms of the X coordinate where Y is now independent. So what I've done is I've tucked the T in the background. I don't care what it is because it's in one-to-one -one correspondence with Y in this case. And so therefore this thing is Y squared minus two Y plus one. And now we can ask ourselves, what does this thing actually look like? So we know that it's a nice little parabola. Let's give it a little sketch. This thing has a root at y equal to one. So that's right here. So this is the point zero one. Again, remember x is written in terms of y. This is probably a weird way for you to think about this because it's sort of backwards to how we are presented functions originally, right? With y as a function of x. But nonetheless, you know, this should be manageable, I imagine. And this tells you that you have this parabola, which is opening up in the x direction now. And we can ask ourselves what happens in the flow of time. So as t is increasing, where are we moving along this curve? Well, if we can point, we can plot some points on this curve first. So imagine uh, we're at the value, um, say t is equal to minus three. Well, then this gives us nine minus two on the curve. So this is t is equal to minus three. So I'm gonna count up from t equal to minus three all the way up to t equal to plus three. Similarly, this is this axes are not meant to be to scale here. I'm just trying to show something off. Similarly, when t is equal to minus two, we are at the point four minus one on the curve. When t is equal to minus one, we are at the point one zero on the curve. When t is equal to zero, we're at the point zero one. So the, the sort of vertex of this parabola that opens in the X direction. When T is equal to positive one, we're at the point uh, one, two. When T is equal to positive two, we're at the point four, three. And finally, when T is at equal to three, we are at nine, four. So what we can do is we can sketch little arrows on this to tell us where we're heading along this curve as T increases. So what we see is maybe my arrows for the 
for the parabola weren't a good idea because they kind of go in the opposite direction. Really what's happening now is we can see we're moving from the bottom piece of the parabola around the corner and up to the top piece of the parabola. Again, if you think of your, your, your drawing on your map of your road trip, this is the same thing. You're drawing these little arrows in to say, I started in this city and I went to this city, right? So there's no ambiguity between where you started and ended. You put these little arrows in. So this little method of algebraically manipulating these things uh, is a really, really good way for you to try and visualize these parametric curves, right? Trying to write X as a function of Y or Y as a function of X. Now, let me show you where this goes to make it even more exciting. Here's a fun one. Let's consider, uh, let's say graph the parametric curves. So graph the parametric curve. Okay, so I have X is equal to cos of T and Y is equal to sine of T, okay? So I have oscillations in both directions, X and Y, or in, in both dimensions, if you'd like. And in this case, T goes between zero and two pi. Okay, so you know maybe you might be tempted to look back at this example and say, maybe it should be kind of similar because I had a sign in the X component of sort of wiggling back and forth. But now it's a little more complicated because Y is wiggling as well. Uh, so, you know, how is it that we can interpret this? Well, here's a really cool thing, right? I, my favorite trig identity, I think I've espoused this before, uh, but the Pythagorean trigono trigonometric identity can help us. So notice, since if I take X squared and I take Y squared and I add them together, this is clearly cos squared of T plus sine squared of t is equal to one. If we look at just the left-hand side of this, x squared plus y squared, and the right side, which is one, this tells us that our curve is a circle. So the parametric curve uh, lies along the unit circle. the unit circle x squared plus y squared is equal to one. Okay, then let's sketch that out and let's talk about the particular values on this curve. So here's my x. Oh, that's no good. Uh, here's my y. All right. And hopefully we can get a nice circle in here. That's pretty good. Uh, you know, it's about as good as my drawing on my iPad is going to go. Okay, so let's let's denote some points. In particular, I want to denote these sort of uh, four intersections with the axes. Okay, so the first one is, uh, sorry, let's turn that off. It's one zero. And that occurs at t equal to zero. So that's where we start on this curve. Then the next point is zero, one. And in this case, cosine is equal to zero and sine is equal to one. We have t is equal to pi over two. Then the next point on this curve is minus one, zero. And in this case, T, uh, cos is equal to minus one, sine is equal to zero. So T is equal to pi. And then finally, we have this last point at the bottom, zero minus one. And in this case, T is equal to three pi over two. And you can fill in any single value that you want on this thing for T. And it's just going to give you the radian angle here. So the radian angle is T and it's going to give you the point cos of T sine of T on this circle. That's pretty cool, right? That is a really, really cool way of, of describing a circle, right? You, you're, 
essentially, you know, we know a circle is a one-dimensional object, right? It's just a it's just a line that meets back where it started. And what we're doing here is we're parameterizing where we are on the circle. We're telling people, I am at t radians from the right from one zero on this circle, right? You're, this is a way of describing a circle in two dimensions using only one variable. This is really cool, right? This is super fun. Okay, let's have a little more fun. Uh, let's do another example here. Let's say. Example four. So let's say uh, the position, and the position is going to be the position in the plane. So it's going to be p of x y of a particle uh, moving in the x y plane. So moving in the x y plane is given by the equations uh, and parameter interval now we have the, param the parametric equations the square root of t for the x variable the y variable gives us t and this is going to be for all t greater than or equal to zero and we want to identify uh, the path traced by the particle. Okay. Now, uh, this one is kind of cool, I think, because when I first looked at it, uh, the path or the parametric curve didn't quite look exactly like I pictured it to on first glance. So let's see, uh, you know, maybe it's a good time to pause the video and see if you can just sketch out the, the path without actually uh, doing any math and see if you can predict it correctly. So for those who didn't pause, or if you did, hopefully uh, uh, this will either vindicate you or maybe show you that things aren't as intuitive as we thought they were. Well, we know that y is equal to t, which is equal to the square root of t squared, right? That's sort of trivial. And that tells us we have x squared. So that means the, part, the path is along the parabola y is equal to x squared. And so let's sketch that out for a second. Now it's worth noting that the x values are only going to be positive. And that comes from the fact that we're taking the square root of a positive number. And so that's why I'm only showing a little bit or, or almost nothing of the negative x plane because we don't need to consider it. And so we're starting at 0, 0 when t is equal to 0. And we have our nice parabola. Maybe I shouldn't draw the arrows because we want to use the arrows to indicate where we're moving along this thing. But of course, you know, if we look at uh, the point x equal to one, well, then we get y is equal to one, and this is at t is equal to one. Similarly, um, at say t equal to four, then we're at x equal to two. So I'm going to put it maybe. Uh, let's put it here again, not to scale. Uh, we have two comma four, and this is at t equal to four. And so we can see that the, the path that this particle is taking is moving along this little parabola here, and it's moving away from the origin, right? As t gets larger, we are moving away from the origin along this parabola. Okay. Now, what, I, what I've shown you, at least with this example, was that you can, um, you can graph a function uh, using the parametric equations, right? Because essentially all that we did was uh, parameterize a, a parabola, something that we already knew how to graph. So the question is, you know, if I give you a graph, can you also 
parameterize it. And of course, this is uh, the case in, in many scenarios. So, so let's say, uh, this is example number five. Let's say, uh, parameterize the graph. So, parameterize the graph of f of x equal to x cubed uh, with x greater than or equal to zero. Well, every point on the graph, so points x, y on the graph have x, y is equal to x comma x cubed. Right, because on the graph, the y coordinate is a cube of what you originally started with in x. And so setting, we can set x is equal to t and y is equal to t cubed with t greater than or equal to zero. Because if t is greater than or equal to zero, then x is greater than or equal to zero. Now, of course, this isn't the only way that you can do this, right? There are a ton of other ways that you could do this. So you could say, or x is equal to the square root of t and y is equal to uh, t to the three over two. And with t greater than or equal to zero, right? That's the same curve, you can just follow the uh, applications that we did in the previous example, or x is equal to t squared and y is equal to t to the sixth with t greater than or equal to zero, or dot, 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 right? There's clearly an infinitely many different ways you can do this, uh, but I would say the simplest way is certainly what we started with, with just x equal to t, then y equal to t cubed. Everything else is sort of a variation on that theme. But nonetheless, as you can see, there's lots of different ways to do this. But the point is between these, these examples, between example four and example five here, is that we can, in some cases, take a parameterized curve and turn it into a function that we know and love, such as a quadratic. Or conversely, we can always take a function and turn it into a parameterized curve. Okay, let's keep going with some examples here just so that we really, really, really understand what's going on. Let's say find a parameterization. So for, find a parameterization uh, for the line through um, through the point a, b having slope m. So you know a point it goes through and you know the slope. This sounds a lot like something you would have uh, done in an intro calculus class, for example, right? If you have the tangent, uh, you're, you're asked to find the tangent line and we can get the slope from say the derivative and the point is given to you in the problem. Well, in this case, we want to parameterize that line. Well, what do we know? We know that slope is equal to rise over run. And so that means for any x on the curve, any x and y on the curve, you have uh, rise, which is y minus b, so the rise away from the point a, b, and divided by the run for any x, y, sorry, any x, y on the line. Again, this is just rise over run. That's all this formula is. And so we can rearrange this thing to say that y minus b is equal to m times x minus a. And then what we can do is we can let t equal to x minus a which gives us that x is equal to t plus a. So essentially this is measuring how, how far you are away from the start point a, 
because when t is equal to zero, x is equal to a. And this also gives that y is equal to m times t plus b, right? And again, this is measuring in terms of the y variable, how far you are away from the start point b, because when t, t is equal to zero, then you get x is equal to a and y is equal to b. So in this case, t can run over all values here. Okay, so let's do one last example. And this one's gonna be a little trickier. It's gonna be a little, um, a little more intense, but it'll still be fun, I think. So example seven, let's uh, sketch and identify, identify uh, the path uh, traced by the point P of X, Y, if, x is equal to t plus 1 over t, and y is equal to t minus 1 over t. And we're going to assume that t is greater than 0. Now, this one is obviously much uh, uglier, maybe, if you want to keep it like, if you want to say it like that, it's much more complicated, that's for sure. So let's take a look at this. The first thing is, if t is positive, so let's say, let's, we're gonna put this note up above for later. Since t is greater than zero, this implies that x equal to t plus one over t is also greater than zero. I just wanna keep, I wanna put a pin in that. We're gonna come back to it in a moment. Okay, so this one has a, has a trick, right? I don't really have any, a way of explaining it other than just, you know, practice makes perfect. So let's look at a few things. First of all, if I do x minus y, what happens here? Well, the t's cancel out and I'm left with two over t. Similarly, if I do x plus y, the one over t's cancel out and I'm left with two t. Now, if I multiply these two things together, I get two over t times 2t, right? And so the goal here is to try and get rid of the t's, right? I want to write this as a curve just in terms of x and y so that I can have some kind of idea of what this thing looks like. Well, the left-hand side is a difference of squares. Uh, sorry, is a, is a factor difference of squares. So you can actually write this as x squared minus y squared. If you don't believe me, just multiply it out with FOIL. And on the right-hand side, I get Four, the t's cancel each other out. And this was the goal, right? This is the whole game you play. You want to get rid of the t's and just get things in terms of x's and y's. And so you might know this curve. You might be a little unfamiliar with this, but this is a hyperbola. And so what this gives you since x is greater than zero, we can equivalently write this as the square root of four minus y squared, although I'm not really sure that will help us too much here. Uh, sorry, four plus y squared. So let's take a look at uh, what this thing will look like. You might have to remind yourself what a hyperbola looks like. In this case, let's take a look at this curve. We get a nice uh, kind of like a, a quadratic looking uh, parabola, but it, the arm should be a little straighter. So it should be something that kind of looks like this, and then something that kind of looks like that. So I tried to draw the arms a little straighter because it's not a perfect parabola. It's closer to like a square root function kind of thing. Um, but you know, the, it's just a sketch, so it doesn't really matter too much. Um, now, what we can see here 
is that uh, we have all of these nice values that, that come along with this thing. And we can ask ourselves, you know, what direction are we moving in? Well, in this case, we might want to create a, a uh, table of values. So let's look at T, X, and Y, just so that we can get an idea of maybe some of the things that are going on here. This is, again, a much more complicated example. Let's go with 0.1. Uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, uh, 1, 2, 5, and 10. Okay, so I'm using t and 1 over t, right? So 1 over 0.1 is 10, 1 over 0.2 is 5, 1 over 0.4 is, uh, is 2, and then we have 1. So, uh, sorry, this should be 1 over 0.5. But Anyways, the point is that now we have, uh, if you put in your X values, you have 10.1 and you have minus 9.9. .9. Then we have 5.2 and minus 4.8. So these are calculator problems. I just want to give you the values so that we can easily cross-reference. We get 2.9 and minus 2.1. We get 2.0 and we get 0, 0.0. So first thing I wanna do, I'm gonna stop right there. And this is the only point that I have marked here. This is two comma zero, and it's when T is equal to one. That's interesting, right? Because uh, you probably would have guessed that that was T equal to zero, but T is hidden, right? So we don't know that T has to come at the vertex of this thing. Okay, uh, then, we have 0 0.5, uh, sorry, we have 2.5, pardon me, 2.5 and uh, 1.5. And then we have 5.2 and 4.8 and 10.1 and 9.9. .9. So again, if you're having trouble following where I got that from, all I did was define those values of T uh, and then I just threw them into the X's and the Y's. So now what we can see is that when T is close to zero, when it's between zero and one, the Y value is negative. And when T is bigger than one, the Y value is positive. And so without making a huge mess of my picture here, I'm just going to show the direction that T is making this move. As T increases, I move closer to the vertex first because Y, as T goes to one, Y approaches zero. And then as T gets bigger than one, I move over zero and I'm into the positive Y values and I increase without bound. Okay. So what we've seen today is how we can describe curves in the plane, in the X and Y plane, the Euclidean plane, with a hidden variable, a parameter. So we've been calling this parameter T, and we call these curves that these things describe a parametric curve. Now, what we talked about in this lecture is little tips and tricks and techniques in order to sketch these things. It is always, always, always perfectly valid to create a table of values and sort of interpolate some points for these things. But what we also saw is that we can use our intuition that we've built up from being good at calculus in order to rearrange these equations in some cases in order to write them in terms of functions we know, right? It could be, you know, y is equal to x squared, or it might be the other way around. It might be x is equal to y squared. But nonetheless, we have a wealth of knowledge from calculus already. We definitely don't want to forget that, and we want to be able to use it whenever we can.